Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're very pleased to welcome all our presenters today who have kindly agreed to deliver this session as part of Global Asbestos Week. Speaking at today's webinar, we've got Craig Foyle, IOSH Immediate Past President, Linda Rainstein of Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization, and Jonathan Ford of BOHS. Before we start, for those of you who haven't attended one of our Irish webinars, I am Dimple Chohan and I take care of the technical aspects of these sessions. Any problems and I shall try to assist as best I can. On your screen, most likely located at the top left hand side, you will notice a small bar with some written options on them, which are chat and Q&A. If you have any technical issues or audio problems and need to message me at any point, please use the chat option. If you have any specific questions relating to the content of the session, please use this option and ask your questions here. Craig will run through all of these with the speakers after the presentation has finished and will aim to tackle as many of these as possible. If we do run out of time and there are still questions remaining, we will look at these after the webinar. Please also note that this webinar will be recorded and will be uploaded and available to view on our YouTube channel. We will be sending out the link to the presentation recording to the email address you have registered with. So please look out for this email. So with all that said, I shall now hand you over to Craig Foyle and hope you all enjoy the session. Hello everybody. Welcome to our webinar, Preventing Asbestos Exposure Risks, in partnership with founders of Global Asbestos Awareness Week, the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organisation and the British Occupational Hygiene Society. We're delighted that you've joined us today. I'd like to welcome and introduce our panellists, Linda Rainstein, founder of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organisation, and Jonathan Ford, board member of the British Occupational Hygiene Society's Faculty of Asbestos Assessment and Management. And no time to lose. With the backing of over 330 supporter organisations worldwide has already shown how we can combat work-related cancers by taking action together. For the past year, we have been working hard to tackle the deadliest of them all, asbestos. No Time to Lose aims to reach the workers most at risk and least aware of the world's most lethal workplace carcinogen. In this webinar, you'll learn about Global Asbestos Awareness Week and ways to limit asbestos exposure risk, what the duty to manage asbestos is and how this is enforced in the United Kingdom, assessing and preventing asbestos exposure risks and principles that apply worldwide, how you can get involved in the No Time to Lose Asbestos campaign and help make a difference. There will also be opportunities for questions at the end of this webinar. If you are using social media today, please use the hashtag 2019GAAW and hashtag NTTL Asbestos. Thank you once again for supporting our No Time To Lose campaign. So I'd now like to welcome Linda Rainstein, founder of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization, who will provide more information on Global Asbestos Awareness Week and ways to limit asbestos exposure risks. Thank you, Craig. It's, it's an honor to join you today. Uh, I want to spend my time talking not only about it, Global Asbestos Awareness Week, but mitigating and eliminating the asbestos exposure risks as we see them in the United States. Uh, during the PowerPoints, I really hope that you do get social, like Craig mentioned, and use the hashtag 2019GAAW. We all know that partnering for, for prevention is our, one of our strongest assets in the fight against asbestos. Quite simply, it was 15 years ago that I realized that asbestos hadn't been banned when my husband was diagnosed with cancer. We did found the co-found the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. And what our mission is, is to work with education, advocacy, and community to prevent exposure to eliminate diseases. But the real problem you have is how can you reach the worker or the businesses or just to consumers so they understand the risk behind asbestos when you can't see it, taste it, touch it, or smell it. So we developed this penny slide, which we began taking to Washington, DC, which is where I am now, and also to share with the media. 
This picture is a stark reminder of what happens with asbestos. Allen did have work, occupational and not occupational exposure. He was diagnosed in 2003 when he was only 63. He fought a very hard asbestos mesothelioma battle and he ultimately died with our then 13 year old daughter and me by his side. I carry on my work out of respect to Allen, but really the hundreds of thousands of Allens. When we talk in Washington about asbestos, so I'd like to frame it in the three waves about mining and manufacturing. And the United States only stopped mining asbestos in 2002. So it's not just the workers that are exposed, and you can see some badges of, of companies who did use asbestos, but also workers that come home and they haven't decontaminated properly and they hug possibly their child or their wife does their laundry. We're presently in wave three, which is very shocking right now. It's obviously the legacy contamination that we deal with. Um, and we're finding in the United States for some business owners, it's cheaper to do it wrong and pay the fine than to do it right, which is clearly something we would never agree with. Uh, but the United States significantly faces a legacy problem. Many of you may recognize this image. It's obviously one of the World Trade Center towers before it imploded after 9-11. And it's important to know that half of that tow the towers were built with asbestos. So not only were other carcinogens released, but hundreds and thousands of tons of asbestos were released. We consumed over 31 million metric tons in, since 1900, which leaves us with a significant problem about mitigating and eliminating asbestos risk. Um, this line chart will show you some of the touch points of the early 1900s when we became aware that asbestos exposure was linked to disease. And you can see at the top those two red dots was one on the left is when Irving Selikoff in 64 began using his power as a physician. The very top is, is one as a widow that I'm mortified to see is in 73 we actually imported over 800 million tons of asbestos. So the EPA tried to ban asbestos in 89, which is the last circle you'll see, and it may look like we don't use asbestos, but that's incorrect. Um, the manufacturer sectors using ADO's analysis, you can see that we've gone from roofing and construction products to in 2011 to basically the one industry that uses and imports raw asbestos is the chloralkali industry. So most industries recognize that asbestos is a carcinogen and there is no safe level except for the chloralkali industry. This is a big business. So when we talk about mitigating risk, we need to know that there's a lot of dollars behind use and improper abatement. The Russians uh, designed this graphic showing President Trump's face uh, on like a saran wrap that's wrapped around their raw asbestos bags and it says approved by Donald Trump, 45th president. So you can see how Russia tries to align itself with our president who thinks asbestos is 100% safe. Uh, that's anything but the truth. This slide tells you that in 2018, the United States imported 750 metric tons of asbestos from Brazil and Russia, clearly unacceptable. But it's not just the United States, although we serve as a, as a reason why we should ban asbestos when we look at the UK, I want you to look at Russia, Kazakhstan, China, and Brazil. You can see that production is still quite active and it's about 1.5 million tons of asbestos every year that's mined. It is decreasing, however. We have many studies and reports I think might be interesting to the webinar viewers. Um, asbestos in schools is a very important issue for, for me and for ADAO. We know that the EPA is, is mishandling the regulation with AHERA. Um, and I'll be honest, most times people can't identify or manage the risk, so we look at policy to help us do that. But in schools, people just have a blanket trust that everything is fine. So I think understanding the regulations in our that are in place, but also are schools compliant and what can you do if they are not. Um, this slide is very important. NIOSH did a study in 2013 uh, with three cohorts of firefighters and the study did confirm that they had a rate of two times greater than the US population for developing mesothelioma and that supports our very uh, extensive legacy risk. When we think about deaths, it's not just a worker um, problem, it's, it's also families and environmental exposure. And last year there was a new study that basically ratcheted up, sadly, the mortality rate. So in the United States, quite simply, nearly 40,000 Americans die every year, every year of preventable asbestos-caused diseases, yet imports remain legal and lethal. 
It's expensive in dollars in life. Uh, my colleague slide, Paul Demers, did, they did a study in Canada and it, lung cancer and mesothelioma costs about $1 million to treat. And that's just healthcare, out, lost productivity and other aspects. But we know that you in the UK and of course um, IOSH, prevention is essential. So we have the facts and the figures and the mortality to support that. So what do we do? I work very closely with lawmakers in Washington, D.C., so prevention and policy is essential to my work since we haven't banned asbestos. Um, knowing that even if we banned asbestos, there's a long time before we can actually truly uh, eradicate the risk of asbestos. So ADO developed this website. So the end user, whether you're a homeowner, a worker, or a business, can find all the government regulations quite simply put into one spot, which has been a great resource for all of us. It is about our stories. How can we reach workers and let them know that the materials that IOSH has are so important that they should take time and they should listen to BOSH and others and look about prevention and training. So we do collectively, I'm a digital storyteller, share our asbestos stories. On the bottom right, you'll see Mavis and I, who has rock star status in the United States and the UK. We love her. But each one of these photographs is an asbestos victim who shares a quote um, so that together we can raise our voice. Uh, just Monday, uh, we had a great uh, um, a landmark accomplishment. The Surgeon General again uh, issued an Asbestos Awareness Week warning. Um, so reaching the um, our America and also hopefully around the world with our resolution, Senate 92, urging the Surgeon General to do that, he did issue it to half a million people. So this week for us is more than a week. It should be our mantra. We should be working on asbestos awareness every single day, which I know both organizations on this webinar do, but I'm hoping the listeners will follow all of us so that together we can make change happen. Using our stories and our influence after 15 years in Washington, uh, just this March, we had uh, four lawmakers, uh, both uh, Senate and House, so we have a bicameral bill that was introduced in March. It's called the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos Now Act which would ban asbestos uh, w one year after the bill is enacted. So we do need your support. Um, the pushback that I get is we need asbestos. There's no replacement. And clearly you in the UK and others around the world serve as, a, as an example of how we can best as as ban asbestos and work to mitigate the risk. Uh, tomorrow, uh, actually Saturday is going to be terrific. Um, you can join us by way of live stream and hear Bev and others. Ten countries are coming together for our 15th conference, and we're going to be talking about diagnosing and treating asbestos caused diseases, but also prevention and global advocacy, which makes it a unique opportunity for a conference to really hear from all different experts. So join us with the hashtag or by live streaming. Um, most importantly, I want to thank you for giving me the time this morning. I'll make my slides available. You can find me on Twitter. But I really hope this, that this, the knowledge from today moves on to the month and throughout the year for global asbestos awareness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. We will take questions at the end. While Jonathan just changes the slide set to his, I'll just uh, read out one comment, actually. Uh, and that's from Mavis Nye. Uh, Mavis Nye was at the launch of the NTTL um, phase in April last year and I met Nav Mavis there uh, and also when I've been out delivering NTTL presentations um, in, in Hong Kong would you believe but also back in the UK I always make a point of saying hello to Mavis and I get my speakers to and uh, audience to as well so you have uh, you have our support Mavis but your comments are all this asbestos imported and used yet they pay compensation in courts to mesothelioma patients um, so double standards and you're quite right does this not show the politicians they should ban asbestos so certainly something which we need to uh, to move forward with okay so uh, so I would like to introduce Jonathan Ford from BOHS Jonathan if you're able to take control of the screen there you are and I will hand over to you Jonathan right hello uh, so, yeah, so my name is Jonathan Ford, I'm the Quality Manager for WYG's Asbestos Team and I represent the BOHS on the, the Faculty of Asbestos Assessments and Management uh, for today's um, session. So the, the, the topic for, for this particular presentation then uh, is <coughs> uh, assessing and preventing asbestos risks and the principles that can apply worldwide. And clearly we've got different um, standards of legislation and different standards to which those um, such instruments have applied uh, throughout the world. 
if you want to look at some of those that are in use in the UK, Europe and, and wider. Okay. So what I'll go through is um, the issue that we have in the UK and globally uh, for asbestos exposure, uh, including the types of scenarios on site uh, that can lead into asbestos exposure. I'll just talk a little bit about the, the duty to manage asbestos, um, where that applies in the UK or how that is applied in the UK. Um, and then we'll discuss a little bit about how that does apply uh, elsewhere across the world. Uh, talk about some control measures for how we actually protect people in the workplace uh, from exposures to asbestos in the first place. And then also about where workers accidentally disturb asbestos materials, uh, what actions can they carry out uh, to, to mitigate uh, that kind of incident. Uh, following on with that, uh, contaminate materials and clothing, uh, correct disposal methods for those, leading on to who should be removing asbestos, so there's very specific contractors who should be doing this kind of work, uh, not for the general workforce. Then I'll talk a little bit about the BOHS, the Faculty of Asbestos Assessment and Management, uh, and BOHS's Breathe Freely uh, initiative as well. So asbestos exposure within the UK, it's the, it's the largest single industrial killer within the UK and Ireland. Uh, it has been for many years and still is. Uh, typically around about 5,500 deaths per year uh, at the last count from HSE. And we reckon about 1 in 150 West European men in their 50s are going to die of mesothelioma uh, as a result of historical uh, exposures in the workplace and at home. About 40% of those uh, deaths of people who've worked in construction-related industries, but it's not just limited to those. We've also got teachers, for example, uh, who work in buildings primarily constructed with a lot of asbestos materials in them, such as the system-built buildings from the 1950s and so on, um, where exposure in their workplace, not as a result of their work type, their category, but the kind of buildings they're working in, uh, it also does lead to asbestos exposures and mesothelioma. Um, and then in fact, as a result of all of that, of our historical use, we've got ongoing studies to track um, work of exposure and the development and uh, the epidemiology, obviously, of, of the asbestos-related diseases within the UK, linking them to those past exposures, the introduction of legislation, and how we expect um, the, the death rate to tail off uh, over time as a result of the, the impact of legislation and better controls. Contrast that with worldwide. We reckon about 125 million people in the world are exposed to asbestos at the workplace. That's figures taken from the, the World Health Organization. Uh, and in one year alone, so in 2004, uh, the last set of data they've got, uh, mesothelioma and asbestos, asbestosis and lung cancer accounted for 107,000 deaths uh, in, in that single year. Uh, and aside from that, there's lots of other asbestos-related diseases leading to death uh, as a result of non-occupational exposures. Uh, but in the UK, then, so we're similar to what Linda um, discussed uh, from America, um, we did have a peak of asbestos use in the UK. Our peak imports were in 1967, uh, sort, of, sort of six years prior to, to the US's peak. We got voluntary bans from the industry on certain types of asbestos, so the amphibole asbestos in the 70s and in the early 80s. It wasn't until 1985 that we actually had a formal ban on the use of or the import of uh, and amosite, followed by 1992 and 1999 bans on chrysotile products. And then since then, we do still occasionally come across asbestos materials introduced into buildings, but it tends to be sort of almost accidental, where um, second-hand plants, for example, has been introduced onto a new building, uh, or where contractors have used of new old stock or recycled materials in construction. And within Europe, uh, we were slightly ahead of the curve of European legislation. Um, so it wasn't until... In 2005, that the EU legislation required all EU member states to have banned asbestos formally. So we were six years ahead of that. And so there should be no new uses of asbestos. There should be some degree of management of the existing material, which will lead us on to our duty to manage within the UK. Uh, and it also requires controls on all work with asbestos materials. Uh, outside of, of Europe, uh, worldwide, um, this is a, a, a representation here from the International Ban of Asbestos Secretariat, another useful forum uh, on the internet for uh, all things asbestos and asbestos exposure. So all the countries highlighted in green um, are those where there is a ban in place uh, and those shaded in um, any of the other colours either still use it uh, and to what degree they do. So again, we mentioned about um, Brazil uh, being an, an exporter, uh, even though they do have restrictions on uh, the use of asbestos now themselves, which will export it, uh, and then leading on to Russia and Kazakhstan and China, 
and India is the other big players in the asbestos market. Canada haven't recently um, signed up to the Rotterdam Convention, but that was in 2012. Okay, so what kind of um, scenarios within the workplace may lead to asbestos exposure nowadays? Now that we're not using it uh, intentionally, how do we still come across exposure? Well, the primary one is accidental damage to asbestos materials, uh, whether they've been previously identified uh, or where workers haven't checked the asbestos registers beforehand. So within our duty to manage, we have an asbestos management plan, uh, which should, should have led to the identification of asbestos materials uh, and leads us to properly manage our workplace and our site operations to avoid those identified materials and to remediate any of those that require action. Okay. There's also then exposure through failure to repair or remove poor condition ACMs. Uh, so this leads on to a case recently in, in, a, in the UK news uh, where a, a company had a survey carried out in 2004 to identify poor condition asbestos insulation board. They failed to follow the surveyor's recommendations to repair or remove this material. And they stayed in that state for nearly getting on 15, 16 years. And so they were prosecuted in the courts uh, for that as a failure because of the exposure that workers would have, ex would have experienced from working in the vicinity of those damaged ACMs and potentially further disturbance of those. And then finally, is uncontrolled working on asbestos materials. This is where people either already know there's asbestos materials there uh, or they haven't carried out the proper checks to, to see what, what was going to be affected by their works. Uh, and they either carry out works without the proper training or controls in place or where they carry out works on a class of materials beyond their level of training, such as contractors carrying out licensed work without having licensed works training or having a license from the HSA to do that kind of work. So basically all works with asbestos containing materials uh, should be preceded by a pre-works check, where they're referring back to the asbestos survey reports for the areas they're working in and comparing that to their proposed works. Okay. So this, leads, this comes from the uh, duty to manage, which is Regulation 4 of uh, the Control of Asbestos Regulations 2012, and the guidance document for those regulations for the duty to, duty to manage part is HSG 227 uh, from the HSE, and this includes a, a seven-step process. Uh, for managing your property with respect to asbestos and therefore uh, reducing or preventing exposure um, to asbestos for your own workforce. Uh, so step one would be confirm what you already know about asbestos containing materials and review how you're managing them. Step two would be to identify any work activities that you're currently carrying out which may lead to disturbance of, of asbestos and then maybe amend your, your site operations to avoid that kind of disturbance. Uh, then to carry on with an a inspection of the identified materials, looking for damaged ACMs, uh, which will then lead you on to uh, carrying out reactive works to, to repair those and to make the area safe again for normal occupation. You should then, step four, develop a strategy for your ongoing compliance. Step five, carry out a risk assessment then of all your remaining ACMs uh, and set out priorities for your management, uh, whether that's just going to be an encapsulation of management, no further action required as long as you avoid them. Uh, or some active remediation. You then develop a long-term management plan for your asbestos materials. And then as an annual um, item, step seven is to continually monitor and review your management plan on at least a 12 monthly basis. That would normally include reinspections of those materials as well. So that is fundamental to uh, ma safely managing your asbestos materials in the workplace, as in the materials that are within your building. Okay. Outside of the UK, a lot of other countries either still use asbestos materials or they do have some restrictions on the use of asbestos materials, but there are some countries out there uh, who currently have no such controls in place. Okay. So again, within the UK, we have the duty to manage um, asbestos materials. So even though we can't use the materials, we accept that they're present in the, in the workplace and built environments, uh, and it's not economically practical uh, to fully remove all of those materials. So we need to work around them. So we have this duty to manage so the duty to manage itself isn't um, laid out in those same terms in the EC directives. Uh, however, there are requirements to manage asbestos. Uh, however, countries outside of the, um, of the EU, many of those do not have such a, such a control in place. They're still working towards that uh, as a result of the, the agreements within um, the World Health Organization and uh, the strategies that they're putting in place. So how else do we prevent exposure to them? First one is to recognise the risk. This is not just within the UK, this is globally. Um, countries uh, and um, 
employers need to recognize the risk that asbestos poses to their employees. And once you've accepted that risk and the significance of the risk, uh, that needs to override the economic arguments for the continued use of asbestos. As we, as we saw earlier in Linda's presentation, uh, the, the cost of, of treating um, mesothelioma and lung cancer sufferers uh, far outweighs the economic benefit, the potential economic benefits of continuing to use the materials. So it's logical to say, phase it out and then reduce this, this financial burden on the state and on the employer. Uh, however, there are clearly vested interests uh, in continuing use of asbestos materials. Uh, we've also got education. So educating um, people in a, in a position of authority, uh, educating employers and educating workers as well uh, about these issues about asbestos. So the health effects of asbestos exposure, the fact that exposure leads to fatal diseases, uh, and also to educate people in how they can carry out their work safely and avoid exposure in the first place. So training for that, for example, in the UK, these are asbestos awareness training, uh, non-licensed work training, including notifiable works, and then for licensed works training for licensed contractors. Um, also to prevent exposure, we have legislation. This controls work around uh, asbestos materials, it controls management of those materials where they are present in the built environment, includes effective enforcement for when people do breach those, regu uh, breach those regulations and for significant penalties to actually act as a proper deterrent uh, from breaching the regulations because clearly some people will feel, obviously incorrectly, uh, that it's worth them getting away with um, breaching the regulations because it's cheaper for them to do it that way. Uh, so clearly the penalties have to be significant enough and enforcement needs to be... Um, comprehensive enough as in it's got people feel that they're going to be caught if they do breach these regulations uh, for those to be effective. And then we also need to look at alternatives for use of asbestos. So are the alternative materials economic compared to continued use of asbestos uh, really where legislation still permits the use of? We need to look at alternatives to discourage the use of asbestos. So are these materials suitable in their performance uh, and is, are the alternatives uh, sustainable in terms of procurement and ongoing use? I mentioned briefly before about free works assessment. So this is where a, a worker, before doing a work task, uh, especially within the construction industry, uh, the first thing they should be asking before they start work is, is there any asbestos present in my work area? Okay. So it doesn't matter whether you're in the UK or abroad, uh, we should be educating our workers to be asking these kind of questions. Okay. So within the UK, we would go back to our client or employer, say, can I see the asbestos register that covers the work that I'm going to be doing? Okay. If there is not an asbestos register available, then you should refer that back to the client to say, sorry, can't continue work safely in this area. So we've had a thorough asbestos survey carried out so we can properly risk assess our works. If there is an asbestos register present or the asbestos management plan which should contain the register, uh, we need to analyze that to identify any asbestos materials in our working area and then compare that to what our works are going to be. They may be present in the area, but as long as we're not going to disturb them, then fine, we can carry on and work safely. However, if, if there's the potential for us to disturb these materials, we should stop our work and again refer back to the client or employer uh, to seek alternative ways of getting the work done. Whether we do our work differently or we have the asbestos remediated beforehand. Okay. Occasionally, even with that in place, uh, a worker may come across a asbestos material that was missed on a survey uh, or was perhaps concealed uh, beyond what you'd reasonably expect the surveyor to identify. Uh, or it could be a worker has continued to work in an area um, without a thorough asbestos risk assessment being looked at beforehand. Okay, so what should a, a worker or a site works team do in, in that kind of scenario? Well, the HSE publishes guidance on this within the, the HSG 210 Asbestos Essentials series. Uh, within that are the equipment and method uh, task sheets, including this one, A0, uh, sorry, EM11, uh, which is the, the, the reaction to disturbance of asbestos materials. Okay, so there it is on the right hand side, I'm not going to go through all the individual steps on there, uh, but to summarise it on the left, you should stop any work which may further disturb the asbestos material or lead to further spread of that material. And you should then assess and decontaminate any individuals who may have been exposed, identify the extent of contamination and then report that up the project chain. Okay, So we've already stopped work, but we then need to then, then flag that up for action uh, to make the area safe uh, and to, to then follow on with remediation work by the appropriate contractors for that kind of work. So we should then isolate the access to that asbestos material, prevent other workers coming in and leading to further disturbance and exposure. And then also within that HSG 210 guidance uh, is A0, which is a series of flow charts uh, to determine whether the work is 
licensed work or whether it's notifiable, non-licensed or non-licensed work as a lower category of risk work. Okay. And we'll, we'll discuss that next. Once someone, if someone sorry, has become exposed, uh, any contaminated clothing should clearly be disposed of to prevent the spread of that. Uh, that should be treated as potentially hazardous waste. So it should be double bagged with the appropriate signage on it. Uh, you may wish to retain that material uh, until the analysis results have come back because um, on the off chance that it is not actually an asbestos contamination incident. However, if it is asbestos as contaminated with those clothing items, uh, they should be disposed of as hazardous waste. Uh, workers should never take contaminated clothing or materials home. I just had a, a Q&A pop up there. Uh, HC guidance on asbestos, too many grey areas on. If the work requires a license or not, and if it is reportable or not, can the guidance be made clearer? Uh, clearly, that, that's one to bounce back to the HC. Um, they, they're in the process of um, looking at uh, currently the asbestos uh, survey guidance, analytical guidance, and the, the licensed contractors guidance. Uh, and we'll have to see what happens with Brexit as to what happens with our regulatory framework and whether the HSE revisits that and revisits the guidance on it. Uh, the flow charts I find generally do cover most areas, but then you're right, there are occasional grey areas in there. Uh, if there's a, a work category that you find you can't classify yourself using those flow charts, I'd recommend going to an asbestos consultant uh, and asking them for advice to help work your way through it. Okay. So, carry on. Okay, so, those flow charts that we were just discussing there uh, come from um, HSG 210A0. And they look at primarily what are the asbestos materials that a worker is dealing with or, or that have been identified on site. Um, if it is loose asbestos coating, loose asbestos sprayed coatings, Thermal insulation, so pipe flagging or AIB, uh, especially in bad condition, uh, then it will require a HSE licensed contractor. Insulation board or lagging can be worked on by a non licensed contractor as long as it is done for less than one hour, uh, as in one man hour, uh, but for no more than two workers in a seven day period. Okay, so, it's the, what we refer to often as the one hour, two hour rule. Uh, if it is not short duration, which is that class of work, then it is licensed. If it is short duration, and it can be done as non-licensed work, but may well be notifiable non-licensed work. Uh, other asbestos materials, such as cement sheet, Artex, extra coating, gaskets, and so on, uh, would ordinarily be non-licensed work. Uh, for all classes of material, if the control limit is ever likely to be breached, then it would automatically become licensed work and require a licensed contractor to deal with that material or that environment. Uh, the non-licensed work section uh, covers off um, splitting out between normal non-licensed work, standard licensed works, and the ones that require notification to the HSE on a one-day basis. So you notify it on the day of the job. Okay? So materials that are in poor condition or that are likely to deteriorate during the work would lead to notifiable works, uh, such as um, badly weathered cement or fire damaged cement, for example, uh, is, is one of the scenarios that we frequently come across that would become non-notifiable, sorry, become notifiable non-licensed work. Okay? Moving on. Uh, asbestos removal should always be carried out in a manner that is going to prevent or reduce the spread of asbestos using control measures, effective control measures. Okay? Enclosures will be required for higher risk works, which would then normal, normally become licensed works. Uh, any asbestos work should be carried out by specialist uh, trained staff. So staff who've been trained either as non-licensed operatives uh, or as licensed operatives for that class of work. Notifications may be required as per the, the A0 um, flowchart we just looked at. Uh, and HSE license may also be required uh, for those higher risk categories of work. Uh, following on from the work, how do you ensure or how do you have confidence that the area is safe to reoccupy them without leading to exposure for your, for your normal workers? Um, for licensed work, it should be followed by a forced age clearance, that's essential. But then for notifiable non licensed work, uh, it can be verified by another party, either by the, the, the contractor conducting the works themselves, uh, or we may wish to look at having an independent sign-off, uh, just for reassurance, just for impartiality purposes on those kind of uh, high-risk projects. Okay. Then move on to the, the Faculty of Asbestos Assessment and Management then. Uh, what is it? This is a, a, a body within, a faculty within the British Occupational Hygiene Society um, with, with the intention of being a home for asbestos consultants uh, operating uh, within, the, within the UK. So this is to pursue excellence for, for members of uh, the, the, the faculty uh, and, and to develop and maintain standards of competence as well. Uh, so so that's, um, that's followed through by having a, a formal system of CPD, 
uh, where in order to maintain membership of the faculty, uh, all members have to, to log their, uh, their continual professional development on an annual basis to hit um, specific targets for the, the level of ongoing training they're receiving. So it's not just, I was trained once 17 years ago, and that's all the training I'll ever need. Obviously you need to stay up to date uh, with current trends, with current legislation, uh, and the development of, of better practice on site as well. Uh, and then also to be a, a guardian of professional standards and ethics. So the professional membership scheme uh, falls into, at the moment, four categories. So we've got technician level, associate level, license uh, level, and full membership level. Uh, and then after a number of years, uh, in five years' time or so, uh, we'll then also bring out a, a fellowship level uh, for, for professional members operating uh, at, that, at that particular level of, uh, of competence uh, and involvement in the industry. Uh, and then also move on to the, the BOHS's Breathe Freely campaign. Uh, this is an, another initiative uh, to raise awareness of asbestos and asbestos exposure uh, within, the, within the workplace. And this is aimed more at employers and, and the, the operators of buildings uh, to bring across that argument that we mentioned earlier on uh, about the financial costs, for example, of exposure to asbestos. How it's, it, it's not an insignificant thing uh, to, to treat and manage uh, a patient who's suffering, for, uh, suffering from uh, asbestos exposure. So there are financial benefits to, to better controls, which then also leads to better employee relations, because you're, you're demonstrating that you're, you're treating your employees with respect and you're, you're concerned for their welfare uh, and for their ongoing health. It's not just about the safety in the workplace, it's about ongoing health, it's an occupational health issue. Uh, and it also demonstrates that an, an employer has, has a strong social responsibility ethos. Uh, and that can then lead to an improved reputation, which in itself then can lead to, to more work of a higher caliber for, for more preferential clients, uh, which then leads on to even more financial benefits. So it's, it's a, what we refer to as a virtuous circle. Okay? So it's to recognize the health hazards in the workplace, to understand what those risks are to workers' health and to control the exposure uh, for our workers. Okay? And uh, that's the end. Thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much for that, Jonathan. Um, so we're just transferring to my slides now. Just while we're doing that, a little information about what uh, IOSH does and the mission to tackle occupational cancer. Uh, it's close to our heart and something our members work hard to achieve. So um, from, the, from the numbers on the slide, we uh, represent tens of thousands of professionals who dedicate their careers to helping people have safe, healthy and fulfilling working lives. Um, IOSH is the voice of the profession, campaigning on issues that affect millions of working people. We set standards and we support, develop and connect our members with resources, guidance, events and training. IOSH acts as a champion, advisor, advocate and trainer for safety and health professionals working in organisations of all sizes and our focus is to support our members in their efforts to create workplaces that are safer, healthier and more sustainable. So I'll now give an overview on occupational cancer and the IOSH No Time To Lose campaign. So when we launched No Time To Lose in 2014, previous figures showed that cancers caused by work claimed at least 666,000 people a year. Now, newer, more accurate global research estimates that at least 742,000 people are dying every year from work-related cancer. That's more than one person every minute. Cancer, is caused by, cancer caused by work is the biggest killer in China, the Western Pacific and in Latin America. The research also found that over half of all work-related deaths in the European Union are due to occupational cancer. The International Agency for Research on Cancer states that there are well over 50 substances that are known or probable causes of workplace cancer. And as we all know, the single biggest cause of occupational cancer is asbestos claiming at least 200,000 lives a year worldwide. The World Health Organization estimates that around 125 million people continue to be exposed to asbestos in the workplace. Since the time lag between exposure and developing cancer can be up to 40 years, a significant exposure today could be a death sentence in years to come. Occupational cancers can be prevented so we need to continue raising awareness worldwide and work together to tackle the causes. So the No Time to Lose campaign on occupational cancer aims to do several things. The first aim of this campaign is to raise awareness. 
Work-based carcinogens are largely under the radar and we need to raise their profile if we want to see more action to control them. Responsible businesses are doing a lot of what is required, but they need to do more. So we're developing free resources to help them. Finally, we're encouraging organizations to make commitments to prevent carcinogenic exposures at work. And this is improving policy and practice. Whether you are an employer or an employee, industry body or policy maker, safety and health professional or occupational hygienist, we all have a part to play if we want to call time on work caused cancers. We can beat occupational cancer if we work together to control the exposure risks. We have launched four phases of the No Time to Lose campaign. These are diesel engine exhaust emissions, solar radiation, silica dust, and of course, asbestos. We've worked with supportive businesses to develop free practical resources to help manage carcinogens in the workplace. On the campaign website, you can download free materials to help manage diesel fumes, solar radiation, silica dust and asbestos at work. You'll find everything from fact sheets, posters and leaflets to films, presentations, infographics and case studies. So No Time to Lose is raising awareness and beginning to make positive impacts worldwide. We have made good progress in communicating occupational risks by working in collaboration with supporting organizations worldwide. The prevention strategies that our pledge signatories are putting in place really demonstrate how no time to lose is driving change in workplaces. So a few numbers. Media coverage has reached over 67 million people. 7 million social media impressions have been generated. 123,000 visitors have explored the campaign website. 98,000 resources have been downloaded. Campaign films have been viewed 38,000 times. 21,500 campaign packs have been distributed and 334 organizations have formally supported the campaign. We've also had 122 businesses signed up to our pledge. And through all of this, work-related carcinogens have been highlighted to more than half a million employees worldwide. So in April 2018, we launched the asbestos phase of NTTL at the British Medical Association in London. There, we presented research showing worrying levels of ignorance among people working in construction trades. And we presented new practical materials to raise awareness of asbestos and how to manage it. In the run-up to the launch, ADAO collaborated with us to promote this phase of our campaign during Global Asbestos Awareness Week 2018. We had a thunderclap on social media, which in just one day reached nearly half a million people. Working with Linda and ADAO and other bodies in the UK, Europe, Africa, North America and Southeast Asia, we continue to grow support for the campaign. Linda has joined forces with IOS several times, including addressing African occupational safety and health leaders in Ghana and those from across the Asia Pacific in Hong Kong. And we were really benefiting from ADAO's insights and expertise. We've also worked closely with the British Occupational Hygiene Society and the UK's Asbestos Leadership Council, which represents government enforcement bodies, professional bodies like IOSH, major companies and unions on developing the materials for the asbestos phase of the campaign. It was great to have organisations from the Asbestos Leadership Council, including BOHS, the Health and Safety Executive, Unite the Union and the Asbestos Removal Contractors Association exhibiting their campaigns and initiatives at our launch. BOHS has since invited us to present the campaign at its inaugural Faculty of Asbestos Assessment and Management Scientific Conference and has promoted NTTL in its Exposure magazine. Ahead of the launch of the asbestos phase, IOSH commissioned opinion to survey 500 tradespeople to understand the scale of the issue. Key findings included 15% have never been informed about asbestos risks. A quarter say they have been exposed to asbestos. A further 42% say they may have been. A third never checked the asbestos register before starting work on a new site with 15% of these not even being aware there is a register. Nearly one in five wouldn't know what to do if they found asbestos. 
and only two thirds of respondents recognised the signs of lung disease caused by asbestos exposure. While the survey was conducted amongst construction workers, the risks of asbestos exposure are present across many more sectors. I mentioned practical materials already, but we have dedicated materials available on the No Time To Lose website. And you'll again find the fact sheets, posters and more information to use. We've also worked with campaign supporters and members to translate the materials into different languages. Here are a selection of our asbestos resources in Hindi, Chinese and Urdu. In Jonathan's segment, he explained in detail some of the duty to manage asbestos. Within the freely available resources on the campaign website is a leaflet on global duty to manage asbestos. This has been developed in association with the UK's Asbestos Leadership Council. Aisha's seat on this group is just one example of our strategic partnership engagement to represent the voice of the occupational health and safety profession at the highest levels. And the duty to manage guidance is supported by all members of the group. So I'll now explain how you can get involved in No Time To Lose. So over 330 organisations worldwide have supported this and organisations can support the campaign by providing a few sentences to reflect their commitments to taking action to prevent occupational cancer. All our supporters have offered to spread the word via their communication channels and we also provide supporter packs with additional information to help communicate campaign messages. A central part of what we have done involves urging businesses to pledge to take action. And the pledge is a six point plan which involves businesses committing to assessing the risk, developing and delivering a prevention strategy, briefing managers, engaging employees and demanding the same standards of their supply chain and finally reporting on progress made. Currently 122 leading businesses around the world have now signed up to campaign pledge. They've been recognised for their significant commitment to tackling carcinogens at work on our website and in communications and also receive a no time to lose certificate. We have supported our pledge signatories and supporters around the world to help raise awareness by having these free resources. <clears throat> Some of the organisations we work with, ADAO, Aposho, the Chartered Institute of Plumbing and Heating Engineering, Mesothelioma UK, North Group and the National Federation of Roofing Contractors. All these supporter initiatives have been designed to reach and positively influence vulnerable workers, including sole traders and young people. The photo at the bottom middle of the screen was when I visited Holbeach Academy and we tailored the NTTL material to suit a younger audience. And we used the straw test to try and encourage the students to appreciate what it might be like to have a reduced lung function. And if they take one thing away from, from that session, it's, a, it's an understanding in a practical way uh, and it's important to try and tailor the message to whichever audience that you're dealing with. So over the last year, since we launched the asbestos phase of No Time To Lose, the campaign scene, and more figures there, 7,750 resources downloaded, 3,900 campaign packs distributed, media coverage over 1.6 million people, 4.2 million social media impressions, and the films have been viewed over 5,000 times. To show our support for Global Asbestos Awareness Week 2019, we have created a web page to encourage everyone to get involved by downloading the free resources, sharing on social media, highlighting the week in their newsletter, and joining this webinar, Preventing Asbestos Exposure Risks. We're also promoting the week through Irish communication channels, sharing what we're doing with my staff and our 47,000 members. And now it's your opportunity to join us. Visit our No Time To Lose campaign website. Go to www.notimetolose.org.uk. Download and share our useful materials with workers at risk as much as you can. Submit a supporting statement. Make a pledge. Promote us on social media, especially Twitter. We like Twitter. So as we move up to the question and answer stage, we're going to um, launch a poll. So I'd like to thank the um, 
first two speakers for their presentations, but your questions will come in a moment. But before I ask for your questions, the poll will be launched on your screens now. Please, can you have a look at the four questions and answer those just while we prepare the questions for you? So I'll just give you a few seconds to start doing that and I'll start doing the first questions. We'll tell you when the uh, when the poll is closed. So um, I have a first question. I'll put my video on to now. So uh, I have a question um, from 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 Lewis Ward. Uh, according to the HSE data on asbestos related deaths and industrial injuries benefit disablement cases, we should continue at current levels for the rest of a decade before declining. Uh, this is actually a question for Linda. Uh, we'll put Linda's camera back on actually now and uh, Jonathan's if they're still there. Um, so a question to Linda. Um, have you or anybody else um, done any similar studies in the United States um, regarding um, when cases might start to drop? Um, so as far as studies, no, we haven't actually done them, but we use and mirror the uh, UK, obviously, and um, EU studies. But we're still importing uh, over uh, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 tons of asbestos. So we in the US can see our problem continuing well past, I estimate, uh, 2025. Um, there, there's just no drop. Actually, statistically, it's actually better reporting for disease and death. So the numbers haven't dropped at all. Thank you. Um, question, I'll have a, it's, a, it's a kind of a comment, but uh, I'll give this one to Jonathan. Um, I've got somebody finds the HSE guides on non-licensed work with asbestos, many gray areas <clears throat> on if the work requires a license or not, and if it's reportable or not. <clears throat> um, I, the question is, can the guidance be made clearer um, but I guess also what process would it take to do that? Well, to make the guidance clearer? Yeah. Right, okay, that would be outside of my view. That would be down to HSE to, um, to amend that guidance about how the, the, the licensing part of the regs uh, may be interpreted. Um, if, uh, for, for, most category, for most work activities, um, the path through those flow charts should be fairly clear, uh, fairly easy to map out. Uh, however, if, if somebody does have a query over one, say, oh, I'm, I'm sort of on the border here with this one or, or whichever, um, then the simple answer would be find a, a competent asbestos consultant for their, their assistance with it, with, with categorising your work. Uh, and then at the end of the day, whichever contractor is going to be carrying out the work, um, if the, the work is licensed work, um, then going back to the licensed contractor uh, and asking them, um, for their input on it as well, they will tell you what they're able to do within the, within the terms of their of their license and so on, as in whether it would require notification or whether it would be something that would be below the threshold for their license to be required. Okay, thank you very much. Um, a, one question, can individual independent health and safety consultants also sign up as NTTL sponsors? I can answer that one. Uh, the answer is yes, you can. Um, you still have to go through the same process, um, but absolutely, that's absolutely fine. Um, Okay, so uh, another question. Oh, this is a wide one. We speak about asbestos, silica, etc., which is very important. But what about composite materials, carbon fibers, carbon nanotubes? Um, I guess it's general question, Jonathan. I mean, we're talking yeah, about that, asbestos that is today, one but... well, quite right. I mean, asbestos is one of many um, um, man-made fibers. Well, not so many fibrous materials um, that can cause um, lung disease, uh, whether it's cancer. Or, lung cancer or mesothelioma. Um, but we've also got issues with refractory ceramic fibres, for example, which are one of the, the, the high performance substitutes for asbestos. It also leads to um, pleural mesothelioma. Um, I think it's the aluminium silicate. Um, refractory ceramic fibres lead to that. Uh, and again, with, with, with carbon nanotubes, I know there's, there's, there's issues with those leading to the same things. Um, so yeah, we're, we're basically in a time now where we're, we're synthesising materials that are so similar to asbestos. In, in their performance, that they actually have some of the same side effects of exposure as well, which is unfortunate. But yeah, quite right. Um, yes, they are. So okay, th thank you. Um, so uh, I guess another question. So what sort of information would you suggest appears in an asbestos management system for the manager of a premises containing asbestos containing materials? Uh, the premises regularly frequented by contractors. Um, so, I mean, yeah, uh, Jonathan, if I can pat that up to you, what would you expect? Yeah, sure. um, you, sh you should expect a, 
an asbestos register, um, first and foremost, to, to know what is present in the building. But then you also need to, the management plan also needs to identify who is the duty holder, who's responsible for maintaining the management plan and disseminate that information. How is that information going to be shared amongst people who are working on the property, uh, including the contractors who, who are visiting site? Uh, it should include um, a record of the site activities, that, uh, the ongoing operational activities that have the potential to disturb asbestos uh, and how those activities are going to be controlled. It should also include the prioritisation of any active management of the asbestos materials. Uh, so, so a client, so the duty holder was able to decide which materials need immediate action, uh, which can be um, isolated for now, but then may be dealt with over the next six or 12 months, uh, and then which are okay and, and are in a stable condition now and are okay to manage that way ongoing, uh, and so on. Uh, for full guidance on what should be in, in an asbestos management plan, you should be reading the, the ACOP L143, uh, and read a section around Regulation 4, uh, and also the HC Guidance Note um, HSG227, which is the, the Comprehensive Guide to Managing Asbestos and Premises, and that talks you through all the requirements of an asbestos management plan. Thank you. Um, question for Linda. I mean, we so we know that um, that asbestos has still been imported into the USA. So, what, what's your what's your biggest challenge um, in in terms of what you're trying to do at the moment? So, there's there's two obviously prongs to the challenges that we face, but we do have significant momentum, and working with you folks greatly helps. So, we have to stop the imports and use, which is quite clear, and then manage the legacy contamination, which is extensive. So we're working on a bill, clearly, but that's just not enough. That's why we do um, Global Asbestos Awareness Week and educational conferences and then partnering for prevention with everyone else. We, we have a significant disconnect in the United States about the hazard of asbestos. Your duty to manage, your registries, you're far advanced compared to where we are. Uh, we have many unskilled workers going in to do abatement. And with the latency period being 10 to 50 years, that person doesn't recall exactly where they were, when they were exposed, who might've owned the building. So we have a long chain of, of exposures that has to be broken. Uh, so short term, it's gonna be prevention and policy, but I do think holding business owners accountable, uh, but also giving them the tools so they can be successful. But our government needs to have a stronger hand in this. You can negotiate an, an EPA or OSHA fine down to $1,000 which means you might have exposed a worker, changed their life forever, and the accountability and responsibility just isn't there. Okay, thank you. Um, so question for Jonathan now. Um, yeah. what, what would you advise when an asbestos contractor has issued a reoccupation certificate, then find remaining dust on the surfaces containing chrysotile or amosite? So I'll say that again. What, what would you yeah, advise? Sorry, you dipped yeah. out there. Uh, so what would you advise when a, if, if somebody um, had some asbestos work done, they've got a reoccupation certificate, but then there's a lot of dust yeah. present still? Yeah. Um, first off, that should be raised as a complaint to the, there should be a UCAS accredited laboratory who's issuing the reoccupation certificates. Uh, it shouldn't be the, um, the contractor themselves. Um, clearly, it should be an independent uh, assessment there. Uh, but the first port call would be to complain to the, the accredited body that issued the certificate in the first place. Uh, and they, they, as part of their accreditation system, should have a complaint handling procedure in place to come out and inform you of them starting an investigation. They should have somebody come out, attend site, um, and assess the degree and extent of any, any potential residual contamination to then raise that as, a, as obviously as a quality issue and investigate that themselves internally. Uh, that would also go on to their um, non-conformities log, and it's something that UCAS should then have sight of uh, when they have their annual surveillance visits. But then in terms of rendering the site fit for use, um, where, those, where that investigation then identifies that there is residual material making it unsafe, um, then really the area should be recleaned uh, and then re-cleared uh, as a follow-on process. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one question, um, is asbestos... Uh, R&D surveys are must for refurbishment works. I think I'll just answer yes for that one. Um, I think the, the clue is in the title. Um, but yeah, really, really important. Any refurbishment that that is considered. Um, let's have a look. Last, last question. Let's try and find a good one. Um, okay, open question really. And this uh, I'll ask both Linda and Jonathan on this. Do we know, is there any percentage of um, any data that we know of that says what percentage of asbestos related diseases are contracted indirectly by members of the public 
or visitors, I'll, I'll extend that all to families uh, rather than actual employees. Um, I don't re really, the, the stats that we have are what are collated by the HSE um, as a result of use, ordinarily occupational exposure. Um, but then all um, mesothelioma cases uh, are classed as industrial disease and flag up uh, to the HSE anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest, that that more be one for them and their, their statistics team about what sources of information they're, they're drawing on. I don't know. Okay, anything, Linda? Yeah, correct. So most um, disease registries and obviously the ICD codes deal with occupational exposure. So environmental and <laughs> non-occupational is truly underestimated. So the more we can educate just the, the general population about asbestos diseases, the conversations can be better with their physicians and then obviously recorded. So there really is, I don't have any data on environmental and non-occupational exposure. Most of it is, is occupational worker related. Thank you. Um, so we'll have to close up. So we are, uh, the questions that we have available um, that are, are unanswered, we will uh, engage with the speakers uh, and ask for some responses for those uh, and we can provide that feedback afterwards. Um, so in, in, in a few seconds, I'm just going to, in effect, just allow Jonathan a sentence or two and then Linda a sentence or two just to, to close how, how, how people on the webinar can help with this process. So uh, I'll start with Jonathan in terms of raising awareness. In terms of raising awareness is ask questions is the first one. So if you are a, a potential duty holder, if, if you are a building operator uh, and you've got responsibility for the maintenance and repair of a property, then you're a duty holder. Um, if you feel that you're potentially not fulfilling your requirements, then seek out a competent asbestos consultant uh, and, and get some assistance with that. Um, if you're a, a contractor carrying out works and you're a contract manager, for example, um, then again, you, you need to be um, getting yourself onto an asbestos awareness course, um, which will then teach you through, taught you through um, what the requirement, what, what the, the significant risks are of asbestos exposure, uh, the outline of, of the legislation uh, and, and the kind of information that you should be seeking from your clients uh, before you start your work. Uh, and then if you're an employee, um, again, it depends on what kind of work you're doing. If you're a, if you're anywhere in the construction trade, then you've got a, a there's a there's a liability that you're going to potentially come across asbestos materials, whether intentional or not, uh, and you should have asbestos awareness training as part of Regulation 10, uh, the control of asbestos regulations. So again, if you fall into that category, again, ask questions of your employer to say, I think it's appropriate that, that you provide this level of training for for us, and that way we're better able to to protect ourselves and to flag up any deficiencies in the way projects are, are operated. Thank you. And Linda, how can we work together to help each other? Yeah, I'd like to take the moment and, and really point people back to you folks, Craig, because I, IOSH and ADO have some amazing educational resources. So I would ask people to do three things. Uh, don't make this just a week of awareness, make it a month and a year. Uh, connect and share <laughs> like you, I love Twitter. Um, and then follow ADAO because you as professionals, you can help us greatly in Washington, D.C. to shape policy, but also raise awareness for workers' health and safety. Uh, we do need the data. It's very hard to get. And you guys have some great resources that, that I use frequently in my presentations. So um, I think it's a great, great chance to get together for webinars, and I hope to join you again. Thank you, Craig. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to thank both of our speakers, but also um, those of you that have dialed in and uh, participated and, and watched the webinar today. Um, so thank you for your support, hard work and determination to help us tackle um, asbestos related cancer. So please get involved in our campaigns and uh, the, the materials there and um, get engaged with uh, IOSH and ADAO and BOHS and have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>